Hello, everyone, and welcome today's, to today's webinar. My name is Patrick Hawkins. I'm a design engineer in the Thor Labs Advanced Photonics Division, and I'll be moderating today's talk. Today's presentation is Optical Fiber, How It's Made, and will be given by Dave Gardner. Dave's been with Thor Labs for almost 10 years and is currently working as a senior process engineer. Within his role, Dave leads the development and production of our fluoride fiber, while also supporting the characterization, testing, and R&D for our silica and fluoride manufacturing teams. Dave also plays a major role in the development of our new fiber products and processes. In this webinar, Dave will walk us through the steps needed to fabricate optical fiber from the type of glass used and the properties it needs to have to the preform preparation and draw processes. This overview will include an in-depth look at one of Thor Lab uh, Thor Labs fiber draw towers and show how a glass preform is fed through it from being heated to 2000 degrees Celsius to measuring the outer diameter of the drawn fiber. I've known Dave for just about the entirety of my eight years with the company and I've always enjoyed working together on new products, new metrology setups and processes in fiber. So I'm very much looking forward to Dave's presentation. We're accepting questions throughout the entire event. To submit questions, just click the Q&A button on the top right of the screen, and Dave will address those at the end of the talk. OK, I'll turn it over to Dave now for optical fiber fabrication. Thanks, Pat. Thanks for the nice intro, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining us today for this presentation on uh, optical fiber manufacturing. So we'll jump right in. Uh, here's a uh, basic agenda of what we'll go over today, um, starting with a little refresher on fiber design, talking about the materials used for optical fiber, how we manufacture the glass, how we draw the glass into fiber, um, a section on how we characterize that fiber after it's been drawn, and then we'll finish up at the very end with a uh, short section on the fiber manufacturing that we do here at Thor Labs. So optical fiber design, um, basically op an optical fiber um, in its most simple form, the most basic design is uh, consists of two layers of glass, the innermost layer being called the core and then the, uh, the outer layer being called the cladding. These two layers of glass have a slightly different refractive index. The core refractive index is a little bit higher than the cladding um, and this Core clad structure and the index difference allows this uh, piece of glass, this fibrous piece of glass, to function as a cylindrical waveguide, uh, taking advantage of total internal reflection at that core clad interface or the uh, junction between the two, the two materials with different indices. Uh, the index difference in fiber is typically pretty low compared to something like uh, water and air, which was probably like the, the classic physics 101. Um, example of total internal reflection. And so because of that, the critical angle or the, the most, the least shallow angle where total internal reflection can occur, it's pretty shallow in a fiber. Uh, but that being said, the fiber with this design is able to function as a waveguide. Uh, so fiber manufacturing, what's our goal? The whole idea is how do we create this uh, flexible fibrous glass waveguide? It has whatever design we're shooting for. Um, and we want to manufacture that so that it can guide light as per the design. And importantly, it can do so while being mechanically robust. So it can be um, handled, it can be bent, it can exist in the real world without any damage. And that is the goal of fiber manufacturing, which we'll go through in today's talk. It all starts with the, uh, the materials that we're going to use for optical fiber. Um, and the materials for optical fiber have, I think, some pretty interesting attributes. Uh, typical fiber, the most common fiber, the, the vast majority of fiber is made with um, extremely extraordinarily pure silica glass, so SiO2. Um, and like I said, it's very, very important for this glass to be uh, virtually you know, completely free of any impurities. Um, the reason for this is that as light passes through fiber, um, Comparing it to something like a, like an optic, a lens, um, any kind of you know, what we would refer to as bulk optics, um, the fiber 
has a much longer path length. And by that, I mean that there's much, much, much more distance where the light needs to, to travel while it's inside the glass. Um, so in regular optics, uh, free space optics, the um, impurities are important, but you know, maybe, maybe a lens is one centimeter, two centimeters thick at the most. Um, and the analogy I like to give and why impurities are so much more important in fiber is if you've ever been um, maybe in an old building or in an antique shop or something like that and saw um, glass that has a slightly green tint to it, um, pretty common, especially with older glass, that green tint comes from uh, trace amounts of iron impurities in the glass. Those iron impurities absorb certain wavelengths and so the transmitted light looks green or greenish blue to our eyes. So for a, a window, for a bottle, for a, a, a small optic, that's not a big deal. The light passes through, there's a small tint. But now imagine, you know, analogous to a fiber, if that window was 100 meters thick or 1,000 meters thick or many kilometers thick, you can imagine there'd be a virtually no transmission. Um, the glass used for fiber, on the other hand, um, has great transmission over long lengths, and that's because we've eliminated or almost eliminated impurities. Um, two important impurities are transition metals um, and then water, because water's OH bond um, loves to resonate at a lot of different wavelengths, especially in the near IR. So typically for fiber applications, uh, metals are under one part per billion, and water is at least under 10 parts per billion. Um, you can see in the graph here, this is fiber attenuation versus wavelength, and we're showing a fiber with very low OH content or water content and one with slightly higher water content. You can see all these absorption peaks caused by um, just a very, even very slight impurity. Um, in a fiber, if we can mitigate these impurities and get them down to the desired level, we can achieve uh, losses as low as 0.2 dBs per kilometer. Um, so an entire kilometer of fiber, you get roughly 96% transmission per kilometer. Uh, so one more analogy for the impurity uh, section of this talk. Um, if ocean water was as pure and transmitted as well as uh, fiber, you could be on a ship in the middle of the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean where the, the ocean is miles deep, kilometers deep, and you could see right to the bottom. That's how pure the glass is for optical fiber. Now, in addition to being very pure for, for really good transmission, the optical fiber also needs to have that index difference, index of refraction difference between the core and the cladding. Um, and as per the as physics dictates for total internal reflection, we need the core glass to have a slightly higher index than the cladding. Uh, it's very slight, so for a, a typical fiber, 0 0.2, 0 0.12 NA fiber, which is common telecom fiber, that index difference is about a third of a percent is all it is from that you know, something slightly deviating from the index of pure silica. So one really common way we do this is um, the core of the fiber. That glass is silica-based glass, but it's doped with a slight amount of germanium oxide. And the germanium has a, an effect where it slightly raises the index, and the uh, cladding glass is then made out of pure silica, undoped, um, and we have that index difference. Um, so you can see that here on this, uh, this is a cross-section microscope image of a single mode fiber with a small core and a large cladding and that core has um, the germanium doping. So it is a little bit higher index and therefore we have light being guided in the core. So this method is really common. It's used for most of the um, telecom fibers that are in submarine cables across between continents and things like that. You get really low absorption in the telecom wavelength bands in the near IR around 1310 and 1550. There are some downsides though. There is some absorption at visible wavelengths um, relative to pure silica. And there's also some effects where we see what's called photo darkening um, in the visible and the UV where that those short wavelength high energy photons can actually cause some darkening of the glass which causes attenuation. Nevertheless, this is a really common way we um, modify the index to get that index difference. Another common method um, used in certain, uh, certain fibers for other applications is rather than raising the index of the core by adding a dopant, we uh, add fluorine to the cladding. So we're doping the cladding now to lower the index. The core remains pure silica, 
Um, and then the cladding is fluorine doped silica with a slightly lower index. Um, this method is good for, for instance, visible and UV applications. We get really low loss in those wavelength ranges, um, reduced photo darkening from UV, and also reduced uh, hydrogen darkening, where the fiber can have a reaction in the presence of hydrogen gas, which can also cause some attenuation. That comes up in applications like uh, fiber sensors that go down um, oil and gas wells and things like that. Uh, so, you know, some nice advantages. It's also the pure silica core is the way, you know, if all things held equal, you want to make the lowest loss, the lowest attenuation fiber. Um, the pure silica core is how we achieve that. Downsides are it can be expensive. Um, if you can imagine most fibers, even a multi-mode fiber like this with a larger core, uh, there's a lot more cladding glass than core glass. So if you dope the whole cladding rather than doping the core, it can be more expensive. Um, so sometimes what we do is what we see in this image here. So only a, a small section of the inner cladding is fluorine doped to lower that index. And that's all you need um, to have that correct waveguide function of the core. And then the rest of the cladding is kind of just structural and can be made of, of pure silica. So those are two common methods how we um, change the index between the core and the cladding. So next we're going to talk about how do we actually make this super pure glass. Well, it all starts with uh, with quartz, uh, natural quartz, SiO2, sand basically. Um, but as we've already discussed, we need high purity. So as you can imagine, this sand here needs to be purified significantly to achieve the uh, low impurity levels for fiber. And to achieve this purity levels, we use, um, there's many different exact processes, but they are all some version of a vapor deposition process. Um, and in all those methods, the general mechanism of purification remains the same. Um, speaking generally about these methods, we start with uh, silicon tetrachloride, which is commonly available. Um, it's used by the semiconductor industry at a purity level of about one part per million. So a few orders of magnitude above what we need. Um, so from you know natural quartz and sand to that one ppm level is kind of processes not specific to fiber manufacturing. And what we do to create fiber quality glass is we react this silicon tetrachloride with O2 gas, oxygen. Um, there's a reaction which creates SiO2, silica, and that's deposited in a certain location. And there's kind of two opportunities for purification. So when that evaporation of that silicon tetrachloride uh, material occurs, uh, some impurities are left behind. And then also when that SiO2 is created and it condenses in a certain location for deposition, some impurities don't condense at those same temperatures. Um, this is to say basically taking advantage of the different vapor pressures between um, that silica and impurities to, to leave them behind or not deposit them where we're going to have our fiberglass. Um, so that's kind of how we make the fiberglass um, in a nutshell. And next I'm going to go through two of the most common deposition methods in a little more detail. So the first is called MCVD. Um, it's called modified, or it stands for modified chemical vapor deposition. This is kind of like one of the classic methods to make fiber preforms. Um, so in this method, we have um, a silica tube, a starting tube on a lathe, um, spinning on this lathe. And we have a hydrogen oxygen torch outside the tube, which is going to apply heat to the tube. And, the, and this tube spins, and then the torch traverses uh, left and right in this tube across this tube. Um, we have silicon tetrachloride. We have germanium chloride. We also have uh, phosphorus oxychloride, which sometimes is added in to modify the um, melting temperature of the glass. And all of those gases are uh, combined, or all of those materials are combined into a vapor with O2 gas and then um, combined in the right amount and then flowed into this silica tube. Um, as the tube spins and as the as the torch heats a certain area, that causes an oxidation reaction. So this uh, silicon tetrachloride is, um, and, the, and the O2 can produce um, SiO2, silica. And that's deposited on the walls of this tube as a silica soot, so a porous material. And the heat from that torch can also condense that material, sinter it into the amorphous solid glass, which is what we'll use for fiber. 
So the, the, the torch goes back and forth and we deposit many layers of glass. The layers would be thinner than what I'm showing in my um, illustration here. And then as we, for instance, vary the germanium content, we can change um, whether we're making core glass or clad glass. We can just some fiber designs have many layers. We can create this index profile. Um, once we're done with deposition, there's a second step where the torch um, heats up the silica tube and there's a vacuum pulled on the inside of that tube and the tube collapses in on itself. So we get rid of that hole in the middle and we create a solid piece of glass called a preform. Uh, so this, by this method, we've created um, really, really pure gla glass for the fiber. Um, and this is, like I said, one of the classic methods. There's a, a modified version um, called PCVD, plasma activated chemical vapor deposition, which is similar, but instead of this torch providing the heat, the um, there's microwaves heat this gas directly, and that you can get uh, faster deposition, thinner layers, so more control over the index and things like that. But the method is very similar. One other method, uh, which is pretty common, is called OVD, or outside vapor deposition. And the big difference here is, yes, instead of depositing on the inside of a tube, we're going to deposit on the outside of something. Um, so in this method, we have a uh, sacrificial collector rod, um, and that spins. And then we have a torch on the outside, and the gas, the, for instance, the silicon tetrachloride is flowed um, through or near the torch, and deposition occurs on the outside of that collector rod. So we're going to create this large um, silica soot stick from that deposition process. Um, after that's created, I actually have a picture here, so that's what they look like. So when I say silica soot, you can see what I mean. It's like a porous material, not, not glass, but very pure SiO2. There's a second step um, where we can remove this center rod and then also um, heat, heat this soot and partially melt it, sinter it, condense it into um, a, that amorphous solid glass, which we need for the, um, to make fiber. So that's OVD. Um, an advantage, of course, is you can make the preform this kind of no limit for how uh, big in diameter it can get. And then there's, we got one variation of this process as well, and that's called VAD. Uh, we're an acronym land here, I know, but that's called vapor phase axial deposition. And the idea there is instead of depositing on the side, the torch deposits on the end and we grow the preform lengthwise. Um, so again, certain advantages there. Um, you can create a very, very long preform, a large, pool of glass with that method. Whatever method we use though, in the end, um, the, the product is what we call a preform. So a preform is a uh, large piece of glass. It has this core clad structure. So we have a core on the inside and a cladding on the outside. It's basically a giant version of the fiber, you know, very large in diameter, something like 25 millimeters, 50 millimeters and up. Um, but it has that same core clad or whatever our fiber design dictates uh, design-wise for the index profile. It has that, that core and cladding in the same proportions as the fiber well. So a lot of glass. Um, these can typically be, um, like, like I said, 25 millimeters in diameter, 100 millimeters in diameter, and they can be um, meters long. So one meter, many meters, but pretty long. And that's a lot of glass, as you can imagine. They're, they're pretty heavy. Um, but like I said, it has that, that same waveguide design as the fiber, and this is what we'll take and elongate into optical fiber. This is our next section. So drawing optical fiber. Um, to draw fiber, uh, we're going to use uh, some very large equipment to make a very small product in the end. So a fiber draw tower is the apparatus used um, to elongate this preform into into fiber. Draw tower is typically um, on the order of 15 meters high or higher, and that's dictated um, by the time it takes the glass to cool from the top to the bottom. The draw tower is typically located in a clean room, and we'll see why on the next upcoming slides. And of course, it's a tower, so we have the axis um, of elongation that's aligned with gravity, which turns out to be really helpful uh, for some of our processes. And the general crux of this is we're going to take this preform and we're going to stretch it and pull it into a fibrous piece of glass, and we're going to maintain that same core clad geometry. Um, 
So we take the preform, we elongate it, we shrink it in diameter and very much um, grow it in length. But at the end, it has that same core clad geometry. And one thing I think is pretty neat here. So if we have a, like a typical, you know, not super large as they go preform, let's say 25 millimeters in diameter um, and one meter long, we're going to take that 25 millimeter diameter preform and then we're going to draw that down into 125 micron glass diameter fiber, which is the common fiber size. That one meter long preform can actually be elongated into 40 kilometers of fiber. Uh, so one preform goes a long way in this elongation process. Of course, the, the amount of material is conserved, but uh, uh, the volume of a cinder, a cylinder has R squared in the equation. So that's why we get that massive elongation ratio. So the first part of drawing is actually preparing the surface of the preform before we get to that fiber draw tower. Uh, and this is all about um, the fact that fiber is flexible. How does that work? How do we make the fiber flexible? Well, there's a lot of steps in the manufacturing process that make that happen. Um, of course, at the end of the process, we need that fiber to be very flexible. You need to be able to wrap it on your finger um, and basically have no chance of it breaking. So the reason why it's flexible like that is um, we're taking advantage of the inherently high um, intrinsic tensile strength of silica glass. So silica glass, um, in tension, it can withstand with with no external factors. It can withstand up to two million pounds per square inch. This is stronger than steel, which is the thing people like to say about fiber. Um, the trick with glass is it's very sensitive to um, defects. Any kind of stress riser, anything that concentrates stress, is going to start a crack. So if the glass is in tension, that crack um, will propagate and break the fiber. And you've, of course, now ruined this. You're not taking advantage of this high intrinsic tensile strength. So in a fiber, the way that works out is if you bend the fiber, uh, the inside of the glass is in compression. Glass is really good at handling that. The outside is where that tension is, where we're, we're concerned about the tensile strength. So if there's any defect either in the glass or on the surface of this outer um, tensioned part of the fiber, that can create a crack and the crack will propagate across the fiber and break it. So all this is to say we need to keep the glass totally free um, of internal, which we took care of in the preform manufacturing, and also external defects so that we can preserve the glass's inherent tensile strength. So to that end, uh, while we're getting ready to draw this preform, we do um, surface prep procedures to eliminate any defects on the surface that might be left over from the preform manufacturing process or from storage. Um, and we're going to try to get a pristine, perfect surface after these steps. There's a few methods that you can use to do this, um, from rinsing to um, hydrofluoric acid etching, all the way up to uh, fire polishing, where we're going to burn off the defects. And that's something we do here at Thorolab. So we have some, some cool pictures of fire polishing. We also have uh, some videos to show of that. So here's some examples of the fire polishing process. Here we have a preform on a lathe. We have a hydrogen oxygen torch. And on the right, you can see this is the uh, surface of the preform untreated. So we can, there's a, an oblique illumination from that torch and you can see a lot of defects spinning around on the surface. This is the first step on fire polishing. So the torch is moving very slow left to right and it's uh, burning off the outer layer of the silica glass and some of that redeposits. So we actually have more of that white silica soot deposited on the left side where the torch has already been. After we make this first pass, the torch resets and traverses again. And now we're going to move a little bit faster left to right, burn off that silica soot, and we're left with a pristine glass surface. And you can see there's virtually no defects spinning around over here. That's the first step to preserving the glasses and intrinsic tensile strength is, is this surface prep. So after surface prep is complete, we can now take the preform over to the fiber draw tower. And the first step, of course, is elongating this glass into fiber. So that elongation happens in a fiber draw furnace, which you see a picture of right here. Uh, this furnace is somewhere on the order of 2000, 2200, 2300 C, very, very hot. Um, and that's the temperature range in which um, 
the viscosity of the glass will make the glass um, not 100% melted, but softened, so we can actually pull it kind of like a taffy-like into a taffy-like filament. Uh, that furnace is a, a very narrow heat zone in the middle, so it only actually heats up a small section of the preform at a time. And the preform is also um, purged with extremely pure um, noble gas, things like argon. And again, we're trying to um, preserve that nice surface of the preform. So that, that gas purge in, ensures there's no combustion in the furnace, no contamination of defects. Um, so to start, we put the preform into the furnace. The end gets heated up. Um, as it gets heated up, that end softens and falls away due to gravity. That's called the drop. So we get this large glob of glass. And then behind that, we have um, that glass pulled out into a nice um, filament shape by the pull of the drop. Um, and the shape that the glass has here in that heat zone is called the neck down. That neck down shape forms due to the heat and due to that pull of glass from the drop. So I have another video here. So this is, um, next video is the drop after it's been heated up falling away from the preform. And it's gonna fall a certain distance and you'll be able to see the fiber, the filament being pulled behind it as it comes to the bottom. And we'll let that loop through again. So you get a good look at it. After it falls to the bottom, the technician is going to cut the drop off and then we'll work with that, that fibrous piece that comes after the drop. So after we've pulled that drop off the bottom of the, of the uh, preform, the next step is to basically begin elongating the glass into the fiber at the correct diameter. So we take that fiber after the drop's been cut off and we pull it all the way down to the bottom of the um, draw tower and we um, put it into what's called the capstan wheel, which is a wheel and a belt that can pull the fiber at a constant rate. At the same time, we begin feeding the preform into the furnace very slowly. So the, the um, fiber is fed, or the preform is fed slowly from the top and then the fiber is pulled fast at the bottom and in the middle, we have a laser micrometer, which is a non-contact um, diameter measurement. Um, and the laser micrometer and the capstan wheel um, can kind of talk to each other with an active feedback loop. So the preform gets fed in at, at a constant rate, and then the capstan wheel can vary how fast it's pulling this fiber. And that's how we get the fiber at the right diameter. And that's how we, because it's an active feedback loop, this is auto-stabilizing so that um, that diameter of this fibrous piece of glass is going to be um, consistent as we draw the fiber. Um, throughout the fiber draw, the preform feed is on the range of millimeters per minute, so very, very slow. You can't really see it move. And then the capstan wheel pulls uh, the fiber at tens of meters per minute or even faster. And again, that's kind of proportional to our um, elongation ratio, the preform diameter versus the fiber diameter. Um, and so if this is all done right, we have uh, this laser micrometer measuring a constant um, diameter of fiber. Capstan wheel is basically pulling at a constant rate. And at this step, the, the glass waveguide of the fiber is fully formed. So we've taken this preform, heated it, elongated it, and we have the fiber design, the, the core and the cladding glass um, at this step. There's one problem though, and that is if you were to draw a bare glass fiber, that outer surface would be exposed to any sort of defects from handling or dirt or different things and it would break. So there are more steps in the manufacturing process to preserve that um, pristine surface for the fiber strength. And to that end, we add a coating on the fiber. So here's another um, microscope cross section of uh, a fiber. We have at this point, a core and clad glass layer, and then we have an acrylate coating layer. There's a couple of different types of coatings out there, but whatever the coating type, um, it's applied to the glass and kind of seals in that pristine glass surface and doesn't let any anything that can cause a defect get to that glass surface. As I alluded to, there are a few materials. Um, acrylate plastic is the most common, flexible, easy to apply plastic, and then we usually UV cure that to get that on there. Um, 
There's also uh, polyamide plastic, which is uh, thermally cured, and that is useful. It can withstand higher temperatures, so different fiber applications it can be sterilized because it can withstand higher temperatures. So polyamide fibers are also pretty common. And then kind of up the food chain, there is metal coatings, which are pretty expensive and can handle very high temperatures. The coating also in a, again, a standard fiber design is gonna have a very high index relative to the core and the cladding. So if you recall, core to cladding, we go high index to low index, and that allows total internal reflection at this interface. Cladding to coating is low index to high index. You can't get total internal reflection there. So that means that the coating also functions to strip any light out of the cladding. It ensures the cladding can't guide light, which again is for the, the fiber to function as a waveguide properly. So um, how do we put the coating on? That's the next step. So the tower, the fiber draw tower, actually has the coating apparatus in place between the laser micrometer measuring the glass and the capstan wheel. So we're going to apply that coating in series on the draw tower before that glass fiber is touched by anything. Um, what we're going to show here is how we put on UV, UV cured acrylic coating, but the other coating types are relatively similar. So the acrylic coating starts as a, a monomer, so an organic molecule that can form polymer chains, but so far is not. All those molecules are floating around on their own. Um, so this, this coating is going to be a liquid, typically a liquid with uh, viscosity like honey, a very thick liquid. Um, and that um, monomer is applied with what we call a pressure die. There's a cutaway view of one here. So we have um, two metal dies, top coating die and bottom coating die, bottom being a little bigger. The bare glass fiber is fed in and very carefully does not touch these, uh, these metal dies because that would cause defects on the surface. Um, the monomer, which is liquid, is pressurized and injected between the dies. And then basically is the fiber is now coated with this liquid monomer um, at a constant diameter. And that diameter depends on the uh, size of these dies, um, also the speed the fiber goes through, and the pressure of the coating. But in the end, we get a nice coating of liquid monomer. And shortly after that, the fiber passes through a UV curing lamp, and that more or less instantly polymerizes those monomers and the coating turns from a liquid into a solid. So now we have solid plastic, flexible, but solid plastic coating that fiber. And that all occurs, like I said, before the um, fiber ever touches that capstan wheel. So we've sealed in that pristine glass surface. Um, and this, this schematic here where we have coating die, curing lamp, and then a, a, micro, a laser micrometer to measure the coating diameter, that's to, to put on one layer of coating, but some fiber towers will have multiple uh, coatings applied in series, so we can just repeat this equipment on a, a longer draw line between the, the furnace and the capstan wheel. Uh, so at this point, um, the fiber, uh, this is basically the whole manufacturing process, the whole fiber draw process. So at this point, we'll take uh, one more video and we'll see a little tour of the whole uh, fiber draw tower here at Thor Labs. So up at the top here, here's the fiber furnace, the preformed furnace and the preforms being fed in at a slow rate. Moving on the tower, we have a cooling tube below the furnace to cool off the glass after the elongation. And then we have a coating cup, which is behind right here, applying the coating. And then we have our UV lamps to cure the coating. And below that, we have a laser micrometer or a laser monitor to look at the concentricity of the coating. And at the end, here's the capstan wheel uh, pulling the fiber at a constant rate. So again, we'll let that loop through. I know it's a little fast. We'll loop through again to see the whole tower. Oh, and my video looks to have jammed. There we go. Okay, so then after the uh, capstan wheel, the fiber um, 
Sometimes we'll extrude a layer of uh, what's called buffer, some more mechanical protection, sometimes not. Um, but then the fiber is fed onto a tick-up spool. Um, and at this point, the fiber has been manufactured. It's complete and uh, ready for testing. So that concludes the fiber draw portion of the talk. And then now we'll spend a few minutes talking about how do we test this fiber? How do we characterize it and make sure that we have achieved um, what we set out to do with fiber manufacturing? So the first, um, most for one important way to characterize fiber is mechanical strength. Um, it's really important that in the fiber manufacturing process, we achieve that pristine surface and then didn't add any defects so the fiber can be um, strong and flexible. And typically this is verified by what's called proof testing. So what we do in proof testing is we subject um, every, every millimeter of the fiber along the entire length of the spool. We're going to subject it to a predefined strain for a predefined amount of time. Um, and we're going to verify that the fiber can handle that tension. So, of course, if it, if it breaks, couldn't handle that tension. And it's a, it's a self-screening test because those sections are broken of the fiber. Um, but if it passes now, we know that the fiber is at least this strong. And typically, uh, proof testing is done at uh, strain levels somewhere in the 100 to 200 kpsi neighborhood. Uh, 100 kpsi. What does that mean? In 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 force. So for a 125 micron um, glass diameter fiber, which is again really common, um, 100 kpsi of strain equals 1.9 pounds or eight and a half newtons of pulling force on that fiber. So if we can show that the fiber can withstand that amount of tensile force, then we know that um, the fiber is going to be able to be bent and the outside surface can handle that tension and it won't break. Um, Proof testing um, is done with, there's two main methods. The first would be a tensile test, kind of what I described. So we would go through the fiber and sequentially um, pull on the different sections of the fiber um, and verify that it can handle that strain. Um, additionally, there's a second method, which is maybe a little less obvious. It's called a four axis bend test. And we have a diagram of that here. So the idea here is, again, what do we really care about? It's that the fiber can be bent. Um, fibers are not usually used as rope in, in the applications, so pulling on them is, is not a thing that's common, but being able to survive bending is important. So a four axis bend test runs the fiber through all of these spools, and each set of three spools are offset 45 degrees from one another. And um, the spool size is chosen so that we when the fiber is bent like that, the outer surface of the fiber is at a little bit over the proof test level. So maybe a little bit over 100 kpsi. And um, if the, all of those strains are overlaid, we've, we've subjected the entire outer uh, surface of the fiber to that 100 kpsi and verified there's no surface defects or other defects that can break the fiber. In that way, we've proven um, that the, the fiber is at least this strong. And you know these setups, we're going to run the whole fiber through. Uh, so sometimes this is done after the fact. We'll have a spool of fiber off the fiber tower and run it through a proof tester. But it also can be done on what's called online. So after the capstan wheel, we can actually run it through a proof tester before the fiber ever gets to the take-up spool. Um, obviously bad if the fiber breaks, uh, but um, that is one way to do it. In addition to mechanical testing, um, something else that's important is, well, does the fiber transmit light? What does the uh, optical performance of the fiber look like? So a really common tool that's used um, to measure the optical performance of the fiber is called an OTDR. Uh, stands for Optical Time Domain Reflectometer. Um, so OTDRs can be used for multiple things. Uh, we can find defects along the length of the fiber so we can find any point discontinuities or, or bends or things that will make the fiber not transmit light appropriately in that section. And we can also attenuate or estimate <laughs> the attenuation of the fiber um, along its length with the OTDR. Basically, the way one of these works is it launches a pulse of light, a short pulse of light into the fiber, and then it uh, looks for reflections. And it, if reflections come back to the OTDR, it looks at how long did it take for those reflections to arrive. There's a schematic here of what they look like. Uh, not what they look like, how they work. 
So we have a, a pulsed light source and a detector. And those are both um, connected to a long fiber spool, and long can be many kilometers. They're, they're uh, connected with a fiber coupler, which is basically a fiber beam splitter. And the other end of the fiber, there's nothing connected to it. So we launch this pulse in, it goes through the fiber. Most of the pulse is lost out the other end of the fiber. But if there's any sort of breaks, if there's any sort of uh, uh, bends in the fiber or a defect in the glass or anything that could cause um, any kind of back reflection, that reflection comes back and is detected by the detector. The way these instruments show their results is with a trace. Um, we have an example here. So the x-axis is basically time, um, which we know the speed of light of the um, inside the glass from the index. So that's going to be basically distance to the reflection. And then the y-axis is intensity. So how intense is that reflection? And the trace can show us many things. Um, a peak like this basically is a break in the fiber, or maybe in a, in a system, it's going to be um, two connectors connecting the fiber together. So Fresnel reflections, basically. So that's going to show us a peak where we have a large back reflection at this time value or this distance value from the launch. Um, other defects or things like splices in fibers um, can show, they're not reflective, but there is loss. So they just show as a, a step change. And then finally, you can see the trace has this slope to it. So this, what we're seeing on the slope is actually Rayleigh scattering um, in the silica glass, causing some reflections back to the, um, the OTDR. And the slope of these Rayleigh scat scattering reflections is actually proportional to the fiber attenuation. If you think about it, the the law the more the light goes into the fiber before it's scattered and sent back, it's going to be attenuated by any losses in the fiber. So that's why we see a lower intensity signal as we go um, further in time or further in distance. So this slope um, can be proportional to the attenuation of the fiber. Uh, and these OTDRs are used um, not just by people in fiber manufacturing to look at newly made spools of fiber. These are also super useful in um, fiber installations, data centers, telecom lines, things like that. You can see all sorts of um, issues with your fiber network by using an OTDR. So a very um, flexible instrument, very useful. There is a second way that we can measure the attenuation of a fiber. Um, in addition to the OTDR. And this is, instead of looking at kind of the point-to-point -point attenuation, here's how we can measure the um, average attenuation of a spool of fiber. And it's we can do that more precisely than the OTDR, and that's by using what's called a cutback measurement. The idea here is we're going to launch light into a long spool of fiber, and effectively we're going to compare the light in with the light out, so we can see how much loss there was throughout that long length of fiber. Um, however, we want this test to kind of cancel out any variations in the launch condition where the light source is coupled into the fiber. So um, how we do this practically speaking is we measure out the end of the spool. We have a light source going in and a detector at the end, measure that. And then we actually physically cut the fiber a few meters back from the uh, launch while not disturbing the launch. We connect the detector here and that's effectively how we measure this, the, the power in to this spool of fiber. So the fiber that's measured is what's between the two measurements. And we can see um, the loss, and we know the length of the spool. Um, so we can calculate the loss per meter, um, typically expressed in decibels per meter. This is a really um, useful test. It can be done with like a laser or an LED at a single wavelength and a power meter. And you can look at the attenuation at one wavelength. And you can also do this with instruments like an optical spectrum analyzer. Um, and you can look at the uh, attenuation as a function of wavelength. Speaking of which, I have some example curves to show. So um, here are some example curves. And I should mention um, the, uh, the curves that we see here and also all the fiber uh, end face images were all done in our in-house metrology lab. Um, so here we see a typical uh, single mode fiber Corning SMF28 Ultra, so very common fiber in the world for telecom applications, things like undersea cables. Um, and 
This fiber, you can see it has a bit higher attenuation in the visible and then in the near IR, very low attenuation, which is characteristic of single mode fibers, um, under 0.2 dBs per meter, which is crazy, crazy good um, in the telecom wavelength bands. Um, over on the right, we have some multimode fibers manufactured here at Thor Labs. Multimode fibers have higher attenuation. Um, if you want to know why, and if you want to know why the single mode fiber has all these peaks, we have a webinar coming up in a few months where we'll talk about uh, single mode fibers and how they work and what well, everything means on this curve. Um, but for now, suffice to say that multimode fibers have a bit higher attenuation. You can see uh, in the 2 dB range for the low OH fiber, 2 dBs per meter. We also have some absorption due to water. The single mode fiber also has a very small absorption due to water right here, a little under 1400 nanometers. But this is, like I said, typical data from a cutback measurement. This is how we can study fibers with it. So with that, uh, that's the info on fiber manufacturing. And the last short section is, well, what kind of fiber manufacturing do we do here at Thor Labs? So I'll spend a few minutes telling you about that. Um, we have a fiber manufacturing facility uh, in our headquarters building in Newton, New Jersey, which is where I'm speaking to you from. Um, and in it, we manufacture uh, step index specialty multimode fibers out of silica glass. So here's two of our draw towers you can see here. Um, we do many fiber designs, glass, standard glass clad, which is kind of what we described in this webinar, uh, polymer clad, dual clad, very large core fibers up to a 1500 micron glass core. Uh, we do both acrylate and polyamide coatings as well as Tepsal buffers. And our product range, we can go from 0.1 to 0.5 NA through uh, glass and polymer clad fibers. Um, and our production facility is, like I said, located in uh, New Jersey. Uh, we have a flexible setup. We can do prototyping as well as volume. And like I already mentioned, we also have an in-house metrology lab where we can do um, full characterization of fibers manufactured at Thor Labs and also uh, customer fibers. Um, in addition to the, uh, the wonderful graphs and image I sh images I showed um, in this talk provided by the Metrology Lab. We also manufacture, in addition to our silica fibers, a line of fluoride glass based fibers. Uh, this is a product line that's very near and dear to my heart as it's uh, something I work on a lot here at Thor Labs. Um, and these fibers are made with um, glasses that are not made of SiO2. They're made of heavy metal fluoride compounds. The big advantage is we get transmission much further out into the IR. Silica fibers don't function much past two microns, maybe 2.2, 2.3 microns at the max. And our fluoride fibers can go out to uh, 5.5 microns for indium fluoride and about four and a half microns for Zeblan glass. Um, additionally, the fluoride glasses are, are uh, have a much heavier glass matrix, and so they can be doped with different rare earths and there's less quenching compared to a silica fiber. So certain um, electronic transitions are more or less unlocked in fluoride glass that are unavailable in silica glass fibers. We have a, a vertical manufacturing facility for our fluoride fibers. So we make our own preforms in-house. Uh, we draw them into fiber and then we can also assemble them into cables and other designs um, all under the same roof, also here in Newton, New Jersey. And then finally, um, many other fiber types that we don't manufacture in-house, we're a reseller of. So uh, this includes telecom single mode fibers at uh, no minimum quantities, specialty single mode fibers, and many others. So with that, I wanna thank you all for listening to me today. I hope you found the talk informative. Um, and at this point, we'll turn it back over to Pat. Thanks, Dave. It's a great talk. Um, we have a handful of questions for you. Um, okay. So, yeah, let me start off uh, at the top of the list. Um, so, you were talking in the beginning about numerical apertures and fiber, um, how there's a very slight index difference. Mm -hmm. What's the reason to have such a shallow critical angle or a small NA? Well, I think it's it's not so much there's we chose that on purpose. I think a better way to say it is it's really hard to make a big index difference between two pieces of glass. Again, the uh, the kind of classical um, total internal reflection model is like glass and air or water and air. So you have like 1.5 index to an index of one. 
um, that's really hard, more or less impossible to achieve with two different glasses. So uh, glass clad fibers are limited to something like 0.3 as the highest NA. We can go beyond that by instead of using glass as the cladding, we can use a low index polymer. So the fiber waveguide is not totally made of glass and we can get up to, I think I've seen 0 0.7, 0 0.8 NA. Um, so a bigger index difference with polymer claddings. Um, but yeah, that's that's really the limiting factor for um, index difference and for fiber NA is manufacturing. Sounds good. Um, yeah, and I guess in addition to that too, right? Like um, if for single mode fiber, it's really important to tune the NA for a certain wavelength range that you yeah. are looking for in the design, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. you know, we know that the we know the box we're working in as far as what's manufacturable, and then certain um, fiber designs are tailored to a certain NA. So single mode fibers are a great example. If you had a single mode fiber, just due to the physics of single mode transmission, if you had a single mode fiber with a 0.5 NA operating in the near IR, the core would be something like one micron in diameter, and it would be more or less impossible to couple light in. So that's a great point. Is it's also the fiber design. Um, the physics of that waveguide sometimes call for a, a more shallow quote unquote NA. Yeah. yeah. Um, question about the uh, the manufacturing process is. Uh, do you need the cladding to be ultra pure as well? Uh, light doesn't travel through it, so. In theory, I guess you could back off a little bit on quality. So. Um, light does does and doesn't travel through the cladding. Um, in a multi-mode fiber, we have total internal reflection at that core clad index, um, but there is going to be an evanescent wave that propagates, goes a little bit into the cladding before it's steered back into the core. Um, so yes, the cladding has less effect on fiber attenuation, um, but it is it is still pretty important to have that very most innermost layer of cladding um, be ultra pure so that we don't have any effects on attenuation. Um, and additional, additionally, um, any impurities can also cause a, a defect in the cladding. It can, they can form a defect which will compromise the fiber strength. That being said, I already alluded to uh, polymer clad fibers where that, um, that cladding is a low index polymer rather than glass. Those are not going to be quite as pure in the cladding, and so they are going to have slightly higher attenuation. Um, so that's the multi-mode case. In single-mode fibers, it gets even more important because that single-mode fiber, and again, coming up in, our, in a future webinar, the glass actually travel or the, the light actually travels in a region that is uh, a bit bigger than the core. So that, that classical uh, total internal reflection ray optics um, waveguide explanation is not exactly what happens. Um, so the, the, the light travels in what's called the mode field diameter, a region about a bit bigger than the, the core. And so, yeah, cladding, the cladding purity can really cause light to be absorbed if it's not where it needs to be. Thanks. Um, another manufacturing question. Um, what happens to the waste chlorine, I guess, during, you know, like an MCVD type process? Sure, so that's, um, it's a hazardous gas and the chlorine is um, there's chemical scrubbers and things like that, but it's uh, making preforms is a pretty um, infrastructure heavy application, uh, infrastructure heavy process. So there's there's very strict controls on that chlorine to make sure it's not um, not vented improperly into the atmosphere or doesn't doesn't hurt anybody. But yeah, it is it is kind of a problem to to deal with that waste gas after the process. Makes sense. Um... Do you know if grin fibers, graded index fibers, are manufactured with the same MCVD process? Yeah, they are. So, so grin fibers, um, for anyone who doesn't know, instead of having a step index change between that core with a uniform index and a cladding with a uniform index, I can uh, probably get back to that slide. Uh, instead, what the grin fiber has is a continuously varying index in that fiber uh, core region. So rather than having a uniform core diameter or core index, it's going to have a highest index in the center and then gradually um, tapers off to the cladding index. This um, similar to a graded index lens, the light, the waveguide still functions, but the light travels in curves in uh, along the, the core. So the way we would manufacture that 
for instance, in an MCBD process is as we deposit these layers, we're going to change the germanium dopant concentration um, with each layer. So we can actually um, create a pseudo index gradient. And then when the glass is sintered together, um, you're going to have some diffusion so that those steps are going to be smoothed out. Um, and actually, when I was going over this slide and I mentioned the plasma activated chemical vapor deposition, and one of the features is we get thinner layers. That is exactly what that does is that gives us more control over varying the dopant the dopants to make more even more um, smooth index changes throughout the core. So that's a, this is how you would make a, a graded index preform is you would continuously vary um, layer by layer the the index modifiers in that silica glass. Hmm. Um, so regarding bend radius fibers, um, you know, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Like, what type of concerns would you have for people routing fiber into small spaces? Um, any suggestions? Sure. So um, there's kind of two concerns with bending fiber. The first is, does the waveguide still function? If you bend the fiber too much, um, the light rays are going to be incident on that core clad index at too, call it too steep of an angle, and you're no longer going to have total internal reflection. So the light can actually leak out of the fiber at the bend. You know, the fiber bends and the light goes straight, <laughs> for lack of a better way to say that. Um, so that's the first concern. Um, and the second concern is, of course, um, if you bend the fiber, the outer side, outer surface of the bend is in tension, and the smaller you coil the fiber, the more tension you have at that outer surface. And that outer surface, you, there's kind of a long-term and a short-term concern. So the short-term concern would be there's a defect there, it's going to concentrate stress, it's going to break the fiber, um, we're going to break the fiber right as we bend it to that small loop size. Second concern is um, there can be uh, defect growth. If you have a fiber that's left in a tight bend for, let's say, on a year's time scale, um, especially in the presence of moisture, there can be some moisture induce, induced um, defect growth in the silica glass. So um, that can eventually um, basically lower the fiber's ability to be bent and it can break the fiber. So Fibers, when they're sold, are specified with a short-term bend radius and a long-term bend radius as a, as a spec from the fiber designers. And the fiber designers have hopefully <laughs> thought about all of these, um, these concerns. So short-term bend radius is basically just thinking about mechanically. You know, what can you bend the fiber in for a couple seconds if you're putting it into some sort of installation? And we're pretty con confident there's not going to be very confident there's not going to be a defect that's going to break the fiber if you coil it that small. But we're making no promises that the waveguide is going to function, and we're making no promises that it can function bent so small for years and not have any um, defect growth. The long-term bend radius, on the other hand, is where we're saying, okay, the waveguide functions at this bend radius. This is the, the smallest bend radius where we can guarantee that both the waveguide functions, and also we're not going to have um, any defect growth, which could break the fiber. Um, and fibers are typically specified for something like a 20 year installation lifetime. And there's a lot of a lot of math and measuring that goes into um, looking at the strength distribution of fibers so we can guarantee there'll be um, very few fiber breaks along a long length of fiber if it's all stressed to this long term bend radius. Things like, you know, one failure in a million or under on, you know, thousands of kilometers of fiber in 20 years. So it gets uh, pretty stringent as far as, you know, how much we can guarantee the, uh, the, the strength of the fiber. But that's how the, the concerns about bending the fiber translate into those short-term and long-term bend radius specs. Thanks, that's a good explanation. Um, yeah, quick question. Is the refractive index of the drawn fiber exactly the same as the preform or does it change a little bit? So I think the first way to say that is we would like it to be exactly the same. That would be very yeah. helpful as right. in a fiber manufacturing environment. Um, there are, so we, we don't typically have like we plan on the index changing in the draw, but there are ways we can, we can change the index. One example would be um, in fire polishing. So we're applying heat to this preform um, and if we overdo it, so to speak, 
um, the dopant that's in either the core or the cladding to modify the index can actually migrate um, across that index into the other material. So you can actually have your nice step index between core and cladding um, turn into a little bit of an index gradient, an unwanted index gradient at that core clad interface. Um, it can also happen when the preform is heated for fiber drawing. Um, so sometimes that's actually used to our advantage. There's, there's things called thermally expanded core fibers, the product Thorlab cells, um, where we've actually heated up the end of a single mode fiber and let that core index dopant germanium diffuse out into the cladding some to effectively give the fiber like a funnel shape to the core right at the end face. That's a good thing, but in fiber manufacturing, we're trying to avoid that. So we're careful with how we heat the preform to avoid um, index changes. Gotcha, thanks. Um, so I think we have time for about one more question. Okay. Um, yeah, one that I liked was um, regarding the cutback measurement. Yeah. Why do you cut back on the side of the light source rather than the side of the detector? Um, yeah, I think that's a pretty important yeah, distinction. Yeah, I agree, great question. So um, basically what this all comes down to is if, we're, if we have this setup, this cutback setup, and we're launching this light source into the fiber, anybody who's ever launched light into a fiber and tried to get good coupling efficiency knows it's pretty hard. You have to have a translation stage to position the fiber just right. You have to have the light source um, focus nicely into a small spot, uh, hopefully a round spot, and then you can position the fiber so that that, you know, so the light is all coupled or almost all the light is coupled into the fiber. Um, so that's pretty hard to do, especially with single mode fibers, um, but also with multi-mode fibers. And it would be pretty hard to um, to repeat that, you know, if you were to couple the fiber, take it out of the setup and put it back in and get exactly the same um, coupling efficiency, exactly the same percentage of light actually coupled into the fiber. In contrast, the detector, um, let's say we're using a power meter, a photo detector, photodiode, whatever, you can, and we do in fiber testing, you use one with a large active area. Let's say there's a, a detector with a one centimeter circular active area. It's pretty common. Um, so it's pretty easy to get the fiber, um, the output into the fiber pretty close to that detector so that we know all the fiber, really 100% of the, the light, sorry, exiting the fiber is incident on the detector. Um, or to take it up a step, you can actually use an integrating sphere detector and you can be really, really sure you're detecting all the light from the fiber. So it all comes down to the, the connection into the detector is much more repeatable. So that's the one that we choose to, uh, to disturb in the cutback test. And we keep that light source coupling into the fiber, you know, completely undisturbed so that the amount of light going into the fiber is the same between these two measurements. Um, you certainly can mess up the measurement if the detect the connection to the detector is not repeatable, uh, but um, that is the, the best practice. And it, in in practice, we get really really good repeatability with these measurements um, by disturbing that connection to the detector rather than the launch the light the launch uh, from the light source. That makes sense. Coupling is definitely tricky. Yes. Um, <laughs> Um, all right, so we're out of time uh, for today. Just want to thank everyone for for signing on and watching the talk. And um, you know, we'll be sending out an email response to some of the questions that we didn't get to. So uh, for anyone who attended, so look forward to that. Um, all right, thanks, Dave, um, and thanks to everyone who uh, showed up for the talk.